um, hosted, by, hosted by UNICEF and the Global Nutrition Cluster Technical Alliance. Um, this webinar is focused on gender-based violence risk mitigation within the humanitarian program cycle. Next slide, please. Um, a bit of housekeeping and um, information about the webinar itself. Um, we have a translation available. If you go to the bottom of your screen and click the globe with interpretation, we have um, French, Spanish, Arabic, and Ukrainian available. So if you have a preferred language um, that you would like to um, have and uh, listen to, uh, translated to, please click on, on that below. Next slide, please. Um, this uh, webinar will be recorded. Um, recording is in progress. Um, please go to the chat and introduce yourself. Um, let us know who you are, where you're um, listening in from. We will have a, um, an interactive session um, with questions and answers um, with some um, kind of brainstorming sessions together. Uh, so that means that we are able to speak um, however, until we get to those um, sections, please do remain on mute um, um, if possible. Um, there's a question and answer section uh, button on the bottom of the screen as well next to the interpretation button. Please do put any questions and answers, or sorry, any questions that you might have um, into there and we will answer them either within that chat section or within um, the Q&A session that will be live. Um, anything else, any chat that you might have, please feel free to put it into the chat box. Um, next slide, please. So we want to um, uh, thank UNICEF Action Against Hunger and International Medical Corps as they're um, part of our webinar working group with UNICEF and um, USAID, Irish Aid, and CETA, all, um, all providing um, financial support. Next slide, please. So the objectives of this, uh, this webinar is to understand the essential actions and core resources available for the integration of the GBV, of GBV risk mitigation into the humanitarian program cycle. Next slide, please. Um, we want to ensure that we adhere to our gender-based violence guiding principles, which is safety, respect, confidentiality and non-discrimination. So please refrain from sharing any information about individual cases of GBV that you might have um, come across. Um, and please um, ensure that we uh, remain respectful um, when we're discussing um, such <clears throat> topics. Next slide, please. So for our agenda, we're, we will have um, presentation one uh, GBV risk mitigation in the HNO and HRP. Um, that will be followed by a Q and A. Um, presentation two will be GBV risk mitigation and cross cutting concerns. Uh, presentation three will be um, uh, will cover some of the support that the GNC Technical Alliance um, can provide and where you can find additional support for um, GBV risk mitigation. Um, within your work. Um, and then uh, Q&A and a closing. Next slide, please. Um, Pamela is a gender-based violence and emergency specialist with UNICEF. She will facilitate a large portion, the majority of the session today, um, and uh, will uh, provide some of the Q&A and, and she is our she is our specialist here um, this afternoon. I'm Brooke Bauer. I'm the Maternal, Infant, and Young Child in Nutrition and Emergencies and Gender Advisor with the GNC Technical Alliance. And Sona Sharma, uh, the SPC Advisor um, with the GNC Technical Alliance is also with us today. And we wanna make sure to thank um, all of our translators, interpreters, and um, Sonia uh, behind the scenes, uh, everyone who's been working on the webinar so far. Next slide, and I will hand it over to Pamela to 
review some of the highlights from webinar one, which was last week, where we covered some of the core concepts. So over to you, Pamela. Thank you so much, Brooke. And thank you so much for being here with us. It's a pleasure that we can come together for the second webinar session. Um, so before tackling the specific agenda around HNO and HRP uh, for this session, we would like to briefly review what we've discussed last week. So as you know, it was Christine Heckman from UNICEF HQ who facilitated most of the sessions last week. And these are some of the items that were highlighted. So across agencies, we may have varying or different terminologies that we use to refer to gender-based violence. Some agencies would use violence against women, violence against women and girls, violence against children. So it's good that the interagency standing committee has outlined um, the definition, the common definition for gender-based violence actually way back in 2005, even before this 2015 revised guidelines uh, were issued. So the term gender-based violence, the way it was defined by the IAC GBV guidelines, it underscores the structural gender-based power differentials between males and females around the world, uh, which place women and girls at greater risk for multiple forms of gender-based violence. Its root cause is the systematic gender inequality and discrimination that privilege uh, men over women. And we know that even prior to a crisis, gender-based violence is highly prevalent, but highly underreported due to various um, reasons such as stigma, uh, fear of retaliation, and lack of safe and confidential services. Thus, uh, waiting for or seeking evidence, quote unquote, for about gender-based violence in humanitarian settings should not be a focus of our energies. We must instead assume that gender-based violence is occurring and understand and anticipate the risk of gender-based violence in the affected communities with whom we are working. So GBV risk mitigation aims to reduce exposure to gender-based violence and ensure that our humanitarian response actions and services do not cause harm or increase the risk of violence. All humanitarian actors and sectors are responsible for promoting women's and girls' safety and for reducing the risk of gender-based violence. When we reduce the risk of gender-based violence by carrying out well-designed, in this case, nutrition interventions, and when we make safety, dignity, and access to services to our nutrition programming, they all ultimately contribute to the ability of the nutrition cluster to meet its core standards and targets. So the, we'll now proceed to tackling the humanitarian needs overview. So the humanitarian needs overview, as we all know, is all about developing a shared understanding of the impact and evolution of the, the crisis and inform the response planning. So this document, presents a comprehensive analysis of the overall situation and associated needs of the population uh, that were affected by natural disaster conflict or a conflation of all of that. Um, within the process of identifying which subgroups of the population present the most severe humanitarian conditions and needs, we need at a minimum to analyze and disaggregate data by sex, age, and disability. Where reliable data is not available, we use planning assumptions, such as for persons with disabilities, we use the global estimate that they make up 15% of the population. So what we want to do is rather than treating GBV risk mitigation as a separate subject, we want to integrate collecting information on GBV risk in already existing ways of collecting data to inform our gender-based violence risk analysis. So a gender-based violence risk analysis means that we look at the vulnerability characteristics, the barriers to access, coping strategies, especially of subgroups of the population that suffer from multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination due to their age, um, sex, disability, race, ethnicity, religion, 
It can be because of their sexual orientation or gender identity, even their HIV status and social class. So remember the availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality framework, or the triple AQ framework for short. Uh, this was uh, discussed by Christine last week. So in the Nutrition Humanitarian Needs Analysis Guidance, there's an annex with information about gender considerations for nutrition needs assessments and analyses. This is a great example of how a tool is integrated and institutionalized in the work of the cluster so that it creates an, a greater uptake for utilization and usability for the cluster sector members. So as Christine highlighted last week, we use the AAQ or triple AQ framework to, as a tool to identify barriers that women and girls may face in accessing humanitarian aid and services, which if not addressed, may increase the risk of multiple forms of gender-based violence. So where can we find information about, let's say, it's asking about gender roles, um, decision-making at household level, access and control over resources. So one key source of data is the rapid gender analysis that is typically undertaken by a gender in humanitarian action working group, or it can be led by a GenCap that is uh, outposted in the OCHA coordination mechanism. Um, and they do have very, um, it's a mindful, uh, source of information for the nutrition cluster and other sectors. For instance, what we have here is the rapid gender analysis that has been conducted for Mozambique. So while um, some highlights of the findings that we can use, for instance, in the, and feed into our humanitarian needs analysis. So when they were doing the survey initially, most respondents stated that little had changed regarding decision-making and gender roles with the crisis. But when they did the focus group discussions, a more nuanced picture emerged. And the women were saying that because men have lost their livelihoods, they are now more present in the house and are more engaged in household matters that they were not typically engaged or involved before, such as food consumption and management. So women noted that the men's increased physical presence in their household had diminished their decision-making within the home. And we all know that has, as heads of households, men are generally the ones registered in humanitarian aid distribution list to receive food and non-food items, which give them a lot of control over essential resources. And then in terms of freedom of movement and mobility, um, traditionally men are more mobile outside their communities and have greater flexibility to travel than women. So respondents attributed this fact to the gender division of tasks and responsibilities within the household. So because there are there is an enormous uh, undertaking for women vis-a-vis -vis care work, household chores, etc., they do not have the same freedom to travel outside their communities while compared to men. And data shows that limitations to women and girls mobility have been exacerbated by the heightened crisis, safety risks caused by the conflict. So tensions within the host communities were pointed out as one key reason for women and girls to avoid venturing outside the resettlement um, centers. So these contextual information in terms of gender roles, in terms of decision-making and also freedom of, of movement and mobility can help us understand how we can best address uh, GBV-related risks in relation to nutrition sector. So where else can we find uh, some information that can feed into our GBV risk analysis? So we typically have this food consumption score or FCS um, nutritional quality analysis that are undertaken by food security actors. So these examples uh, just goes to show that GBV risk analysis, the data to be able to do the risk analysis can come from um, questions and indicators that are normal and or regularly included 
uh, for it's either multi-sectoral needs assessment or a specific sectors assessment in addition to what nutrition cluster might be doing. And then it's just a step in thinking about what would be the specific consequences for women and girls in relation to nutrition when you have this set of findings. So in this case, the this uh, FCS data indicates that female-headed households are less likely to have diets of adequate quantity and quality when compared with male-headed households. And that can inform your targeting and vulnerability criteria later on. We would like to cite this example from Cameroon. Uh, do we have um, nutrition actors from Cameroon here in our webinar? So this has been cited, I think, for two consecutive years in terms of uh, presenting a very strong analysis of the gender-based violence risks and barriers, as well as coping mechanism. It actually included a specific gender section entitled, How Do Gender Issues Affect Nutritional Status? At the same time, it has another section focusing on the impact of disabilities on nutritional status. So what's very strong about this HNO is that it did not only emphasize the physiological causes and consequences of malnutrition on women, adolescent girls, and children, but also emphasize the impact of the social and gender norms on nutrition in times of crisis. So they look beyond the physiological needs of pregnant and lactating women and children and examine how gender and social norms affected nutrition. So they included in their narrative uh, some sections pertaining to the fact that women face constraints in accessing humanitarian services because of insecurity, cultural discrimination, as well as the limited mobility. And then they also flag that because of this uh, domestic burden, it increases uh, the vulnerability of women, especially for uh, female-headed households, um, especially if um, they have to take on both the economic side of the household as well as um, young child feeding practices, et cetera. And then they also highlighted the specific needs of different demographic groups, such as in this case, adolescent girls uh, who experience pregnancy and how that can lead to poor health and nutritional status, both for the adolescent mother and for the child. And then it also shows the that higher nutritional deficiencies or needs of women are not strictly physiological, but also as a result of compensating behavior that threatens their health, such as reduction of food intake. And we typically see that across uh, various contexts. The Cameroon HNO for nutrition sector also included an analysis of the negative coping strategies specific to women and girls in this setting. So including um, survival sex to meet uh, basic needs. So they said that in the worst scenarios, limited opportunities live uh, women and girls with very untenable situations for their own families and their own survival, including exchanging uh, sex for food and basic commodities, as well as um, forcing their daughters to uh, engage in early and forced marriage. So now we move to the part of the humanitarian response uh, planning uh, part of the overall HPC. So where gender-based violence risks and barriers related to nutrition are identified and included in the HNO, uh, we want to make sure that our response plan includes the corresponding measures that address those identified risks and barriers, including um, indicators. So before we go through the specific GBV risk mitigation measures, as well as the brainstorming exercise that Brooke will facilitate, let's discuss the three standard practices in GBV risk mitigation that you can include right away in your HRP. So the first one is making sure that uh, we consult women and girls. So we know that uh, women and girls are the experts on their own safety. So we want to get feedback from them on which 
GBV risk mitigation actions would best address their specific vulnerabilities and risks. So women and girls are the best source of information about their own GBV risk that they face. So this means that we need to proactively engage with women and girls of different ages and backgrounds, including those with disabilities, because they we know from evidence that they also have uh, increased risk to various types of gender-based violence. We support women and girls along with other community members to plan and implement risk reduction strategies. So it's a part of collective problem solving with them. And the feedback systems uh, should be in place so that women and girls and other marginalized groups can easily and confidentially report concerns, including um, sensitive reporting about sexual exploitation and abuse or give feedback on the quality of services that they access. So in some cases, it may not be feasible to do face-to-face -face or direct consultations with women and girls and other marginalized groups. So this is where our close collaboration with women-led uh, or women's rights organizations and organizations of persons with disability come in. So we can actually engage with them and triangulate information coming from secondary data and reports like what we've cited earlier, the rapid gender analysis. The next standard practice that we can do is in relation to safety audit. And this was um, emphasized as well by Christine um, last week. So it's a simple, practical way to collect information relating to GBV risk. It, the safety audit provides a structured method to collect data and examine the community, humanitarian and external factors that contribute to gender-based violence, whether it's in a camp setting, in a host community or other similar settings. The safety audit can actually be used um, in all phases of an emergency. It can be used during preparedness, immediately following a crisis onset and at any time during ongoing response and recovery. It can also be useful during the acute stages where time is limited and quantitative, um, quantitative uh, data collection methods may not be feasible at that early stage. So the typical data collection technique that we use is an observation checklist. And we do have examples of that from nutrition clusters at uh, national, subnational level. So the observation checklist or data collection technique can be complemented with focus group discussions and key informant interviews with women and girls or local women-led organizations. We can also do a what we call a participatory safety walk method, for instance, which engages women and girls so that they can actually identify and articulate the safety concerns and problems they face in certain geographical areas in terms of accessing um, services. So in this case, a safety walk can be conducted to assess one route going to and from, let's say, a stabilization center or an OTP. The third example in terms of a standard good practice, um, sorry, before I move on to the third one, the, these are just some of the highlights of uh, good practice recommendations when it comes to doing our safety audit. So ideally, the safety audit um, should be conducted by different partners in the same context using the same tool so that you can have comparability of findings. There are also contexts where in, let's say, nutrition plus CCCM plus child protection or GBV subcluster would all do an intersectoral safety audit. So it's more they leverage their technical expertise and resources in that manner. And safety audits ideally should coincide with the HNO and HRP cycles to ensure that implementations of the recommendations would be included in the budget allocations. And then monitoring must be done to assess the extent of the implementation and recommendations from the safety audits. Um, and then there should be that follow-up and m and &E mechanisms so that the safety audit exercise is not an end in itself and that it feeds into the programming, tweaking, and 
uh, enhancement for increasing accessibility. And then this third standard practice in GBV risk mitigation, again, is um, an emphasis coming from the first session that we must be able to train uh, all humanitarian personnel who engage with affected population uh, with regards to how to safely receive disclosures of gender-based violence. So the idea is that anyone, the survivor, tells about his or her experience of gender-based violence has a responsibility to give accurate, complete information about available services and provide the information to sur survivors in a safe, ethical, and confidential manner um, is a responsibility of all humanitarian actors who interact with affected populations. So not only the protection actors, GBV subcluster, or child protection subcluster members, but everyone. So I see that um, Brooke is sharing the link to the GBV packet guide. So it's targeted towards sector specialists who are on the front lines in terms of providing direct services to affected communities. So this range from hygiene promoters, community health workers, camp managers, nutrition nurses, among others. It can be used for settings without GBV services, and it can be adapted for settings with a functional GBV referral pathway, which is what we are luckily seeing in most contexts right now. Okay, that's my cue. So now we go to the interactive discussion. We have two key questions and Brooke will um, do the facilitation for this part. Great. Thanks, Pamela. So just to just to engage uh, with all of you, all of the attendees, I've been looking through the through the chat as you all introduced yourselves. Um, it, we have a wide range, a great range of, of expertise and um, locations, et cetera. So um, I look forward, we look forward to hearing each of your experiences. Um, so the first discussion that we have here is how do we address these risks and barriers, um, negative social norms, uh, gender roles, it's exacerbating women and girls' vulnerabilities to poor nutrition. For example, expectations of women to eat last, expectations of female-headed households to provide food and both food and care for the children. Um, what are some ways that we can um, that we can address some of these um, barriers and risks. And to, if you would like, you can feel free to post it into the chat. Feel free to raise your hand and Sonia, um, we will um, um, help take you off mute and uh, allow all of your um, input to be, to be given. So what are some ways that, that you yourselves have in your context have um, addressed some of these barriers or risks or what are some, some thoughts that you have? And Sona, please jump in um, as well if you feel. So anyone would like to start first? Some of the negative social norms or gender roles exacerbating women's and girls' vulnerabilities to poor nutrition. What is it? How do we address this? So Colleen put in the chats on it. Colleen put in the chat specific community population awareness training, especially at antenatal visits. So that's one we can add. Thanks, Pamela.
Sonia, are you able to, it looks like Ayal um, raised their hand. Go ahead, Ayal. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Ayala from CARE, who is now working in Ethiopia, coming to the uh, social norms that affects the nutrition, the nutrition of women and girls. Uh, here, CARE has been implementing a number of projects, gender specific or gender related projects uh, by integrating nutrition. So uh, one of the, the tools that we are using to address the, the social norms related to gender is that uh, we were, care as a tool called social analysis and action tool by which, uh, by which the social uh, norms are explored. It can be for nutrition, it can be for gender, it can be for everything, but we used it for nutrition for this specific uh, case, I mean uh, for gender. And then um, uh, with that uh, tool, we explore the, the, the norms that can positively or negatively affect women and uh, girls' nutrition in the area that we operate. That we operate. And then based on the, 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 the findings, I can say the barriers and the positives, we, uh, we develop an action or a kind of, uh, yes, uh, uh, action and integrate those actions into our nutrition project. For example, the findings that were presented by my sister here is also the finding that we, we got through the, the social analysis and action that women and girls are always, uh, they always feed le less during Christ or they eat less during Christ. This is one of the actions that we identified and then integrate into our nutrition response. So with our response, what we did so far is just creating awareness using different uh, tools, discussion guides and dialogues at community level, and then creating awareness among men and uh, women uh, so that uh, the, you know, uh, the, the women and girls' nutrition will be improved or they can be, uh, you know, uh, they can be considered as one of the household uh, members who needs to eat as, as to the other member of households. And so we are doing such uh, community level uh, awareness uh, activities. Uh, and we, yes, uh, thank you, over to you, uh, Asider. Great, thanks so much, Ali. That's great. And I think Pam captured, captured that. Um, Angela um, uh, said the same in the chat. So male involvement where men are educated on the increased nutritional needs for women and girls um, as well. So I see that. Um, Hattie, I see that your hand is up and you also put in the chat, do you want to kind of expand? Yeah, um, yeah. Great. Can you hear me? Yeah, thank yeah, you. Cool. Hi, yeah, I'm Hattie from um, Goal. I'm our global nutrition advisor. So um, I, was, I was just saying in the chat, but also I've sort of been reminded by a lot of the comments that, that people have been posting, which is great as well. So it's really important at the outset, because what we're talking about here is, is sort of dealing with socio-cultural norms that aren't necessarily um, providing the best outcomes to, for communities. So it's really important, first and foremost, to conduct formative research so that we actually understand what are the issues in the community, who's most affected, who is being excluded from these programs, who's at risk, et cetera, et cetera. And also during that formative research, which as somebody had said, you can do focus group discussions or you can do key informant interviews or, or what have you. Um, is trying to identify what the modes of engagement um, people will best respond to. So, you know, sometimes people will say, we need to have face-to-face -face interaction and they might respond better to, for example, testimonials. Um, so we've just done some research in Ethiopia recently and people were saying, if we knew, so these were male uh, barriers for men engaging in what were perceived to be female gender norm, um, normalized behaviors. And the men were saying, 
we understand why we need to engage. We would like to engage, but we, we feel that we will be socially isolated if we engage in what are perceived to be women's activities. And therefore the creation of the enabling environment is really, really critical. So it's, it's making sure we understand who's affected, how we can best engage with them, what are the multiple points of contact and making sure we engage with the change makers, the key influencers, but also support that enabling environment. Because if you don't address the enabling environment, those primary change makers and the key influencers often feel like they are not, um, they don't have the capacity to support or influence change because they will be socially stigmatized or, or what have you. So formative research, incredibly important to try and understand what it is we're trying to address, how we can address it and what modes of engagement. Um, but also to stress the, it has to be repeated. It has to be, we have to have multiple points of interaction to try and address any of these incredibly sensitive um, socio-cultural issues that, that we see with um, entrenched gender norms. Thanks. Great, thanks Hattie. I see, I see um, many people saying the same. So a, a lot of us agree with that um, as, on, um, Ang Chai says, as traditional belief, some women are not allowed to go outside to work, they stay home after delivery. Um, so we need to advocate with their husbands and religious workers for that, um, as does Bistrat, engaging religious leaders and elders. And um, Yergu says the same thing, needs to work on both sides, um, male involvement, see, uh, sensitization of key influencers. Great, wonderful. Um, Sona, do you want to read through some of these um, as well? Yeah, sure. There's Great. there's one long one. I hope my I mean is the is my sound uh, okay or yeah, is it perfect. still okay. no no it's it's perfect perfect okay great. Uh, so there is a long one by uh, Victoria about having a gender transformative approach, which will empower women and liberate men from the heavy social expectations and peer pressure uh, that oblige them to demonstrate their power and dominance over women. Uh, create an enabling environment that at the household level that will make it easier for men to adopt improved nutrition practices, male-friendly nutrition counseling, and information tailored uh, to their PPD roles. And I think we need to expand on the PPD roles. Uh, nutrition counseling and SBC campaigns promoting men's supportive actions for MIYCAN. Communication aids to help adolescent girls uh, safely communicate with their fathers and mothers about their nutritional needs. So these, uh, I think, are a very uh, <clears throat> a good set of uh, a comprehensive set of uh, suggestions here, recommendations. Uh, engaging women, girls in IGA activities is another one. Um, yeah, I think. Victoria, if you would like to uh, expand on the PPD roles. And I think Afad Fadi had his hand raised as well. Hi. So Victoria, would you like to? Victoria. Yeah. Victoria. Yes. Victoria um, speaking from Tanzania, I'm working with Save the Children as Social Behavior Change Advisor. So the PPD uh, stand for Provide, Protect, and Decision Make. Uh, so for fathers um, in Tanzania, when we conducted a gender analysis, we found it that uh, most of the perception in regarding to gender roles, fathers are defined as providers, protectors, and decision makers for the family. And so um, we are promoting those roles in terms of fathers to stand and to act for their roles, to support nutrition for women, uh, for children under five, but also for adolescent girls. So fathers can play the role of protective by ensuring that they have good knowledge on nutrition, attending the nutrition counseling, nutrition education in various places so that they can be able to practice the nutrition behaviors and support nutrition actions to support the good nutrition for their 
mothers, for the children under five and their children, but also in terms of providing, fathers can play a role of providing in terms of ensuring that they are families, the uh, pregnant lactating mothers, the adolescents, the children under five, they have uh, the required uh, foods, um, diversified food in the household, either by producing themselves or by ensuring that they uh, buy or they procure from uh, markets. And in terms of decision making, so far that has to play a role of decision making to ensure that um, they decide where the mother can go for antenatal care clinics, but also if they have to undertake um, any um, like um, um, conception of IFA. So fathers need to decide all those things, where to deliver, fathers has to stand and to decide and to support their uh, family. Those are mothers, children under five, and the adolescent girls. Yeah, so that is PPD role. Uh, provide, okay, protect, great. and decision. Thank you. Yeah. That's okay. really interesting. Thank you so much, Victoria, for expanding on that. Um, I had seen Afaf raise uh, their hand. If you want to come in. Hello, thank you so much. Yes. Come. This is Afa from uh, Sudan, mid air organization. Um, I think uh, uh, for the for raising the awareness of the community, we have here in Sudan, uh, like uh, traditional heroes and, and traditional songers called Hakama, especially in South uh, Darfur or uh, all Darfur areas and Kordofani areas. And the people are like uh, their songs very much. So if we uh, use those uh, hakama uh, so as to make uh, education and to uh, raise their awareness, um, doing like uh, yani conducting messages through songs, uh, this is will become yani more effective. And also uh, there is another uh, yani um, thing that is. Uh, if we need like uh, child to child approach, because the uh, messages is, are spread in any uh, rapid, any like uh, sooner if uh, the child transmit it from child to child. Thank you so much, and over to you. Great, thank you. That's really interesting. Uh, uh, um, I think maybe we can uh, now go to move to the next question, Brooke, uh, keeping yep. in mind the time. Yep, yeah. that sounds great. I just wanted to highlight one quick thing in the one quick comment in the in the comments is that as someone pointed out, I'm trying to find it now, but the importance of generating more evidence um, between nutrition and GBV. Um, and Great, so Pam, if we can go to, thank you, the next one. So that was a fantastic discussion, um, really great input from everybody. So we have um, the next question is the same. How do we address these risks and barriers with adolescents, girls? So for example, early pregnancies and motherhood, fetal maternal nutrition, or increased domestic responsibilities um, that keep uh, them isolated in the home, et cetera. So over to all of you again um, for your, for some of your ideas. I think Zuhel just raised the hand. Go ahead, yeah. Go ahead. Hello, this is Suhan from uh, Sudan, working as gender integration officer in uh, Mercy Corp Europe. Uh, regarding um, uh, the awareness to identify, identify the social negative norm, it is better to make like the community action plan, SCAPS, uh, to intervene with the community. The, the, of a discussion with the community leaders, uh, women representative, women uh, from uh, different uh, ethnic groups to identify what are their problems, their priorities and their solution. And uh, if we can make like the community clubs uh, in consist of the youth especially, and uh, also engage with the health department in the different uh, states in the state level or also in the uh, federal level, and also if we could uh, make like uh, the community radios for the uh, people 
to join together to discuss how to raise up the awareness among the uh, themselves in regards to issues related to the health. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Victoria, do you want to, to come off mute? Yeah, so for us from Tanzania, USA, Delicious and Elev, uh, what we've done is um, we have developed the nutrition SBC materials that targeting adolescent girls and boys, uh, both in schools and others for out of schools. Uh, but also we are initiating um, support groups for adolescents. And these groups, um, they encourage adolescents to attend because they see that um, they are themselves, they can discuss their issues um, and they can share their challenges. But also, we're also prioritizing them in terms of um, productive asset distribution. So they are initiating businesses, but also production of animal source food like chickens, uh, rabbits. Um, um, some of them are involved in aquaculture. For when they get productions, produce, some of which they use for consumption, others they use for as business. So that one is also encouraging them and uh, empower them. Uh, yeah, so that's what we are doing. Thank you. Great, thank you. FF, would you like to come off mute? Yes, uh, also uh, uh, health education and uh, awareness raising for the uh, religious uh, leaders and uh, uh, community volunteers. So as because those are the key person for uh, the community. And uh, here in Sudan, uh, that is uh, for the religious leaders like Imam, people are uh, less are uh, yani, like um, uh, yani, learn from them and uh, take their their ideas in considerations. And if they are uh, saying some things, people are follow it. And so we also we need to like make like uh, elder edu education for the elderly, especially women. Because most of the women are are uh, uneducated and are just yeah, any, uh, follow the, the 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 advice from grandma and grandpa. Great, thank you, Afa. Um, we have also in the comments, Mr. says investing on girls' educations, uh, girls' education, and as well as. Um, it's still necessary to consider male involvement um, throughout the process. Um, and introduction of birth spacing options, peer-to-peer um, -peer support for adolescent girls to change perceptions around early child, uh, early marriages, uh, working with parents, both mother and father and community leaders to understand the negative impact of um, early marriage and early pregnancies and encouraging adolescents and young mothers to participate in mother support group sessions conducted in their respective communities. And um, we'll take Zuhal, uh, you have your hand up if you want to come off mute. And then we'll move to a question and answer um, section for a few minutes just after this. Go ahead, Zuhal. So how you're on mute, or maybe it was a, a hand that was previously previously raised. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, Hello? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Uh, sorry, because the network sometimes is went off. That is why oh, no, I missed something. But uh, anyway, regarding the, also the um, when we establish uh, the community clubs, uh, the objective of the community clubs should be that. Uh, the community uh, volunteers or the health workers in the rural areas, especially that for the people who doesn't have any access to the internet or something like that, they can make the laser club, they can discuss everything and uh, they can make like uh, the networks in the village that each one can uh, uh, send the messages or sensitize the messages to that the nutrition and health also. Uh, also, uh, in addition to participatory theater or mobile theater for the um, 
for the health or nutrition awareness would be mobile theater. It would be good idea for. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Sona, can I hand it over to you for the last five minutes of the discussion? If there's uh, any questions and answer or questions that are remaining, etc. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Brooke. Um, there were a couple of other comments also in the chat uh, related to this particular slide, which is nutrition support for development for adolescents. That's a great suggestion. Um, and then in, in most societies, young mothers are helped by their mothers and older ladies in the families, maybe in the context of human, humanitarian crisis, the setup is not there. So the young mother experiences de depression and isolation, feeling difficulties to fulfill the parental role. This may put them at risk of GBV. So I think those are uh, uh, great uh, inputs and great insights uh, from your experiences. Thank you for sharing those. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A and uh, we will go to that first uh, and then maybe I think there were some questions put in the chat as well. Um, there's one from Chai that says, as a traditional and uh, belief, some women are not allowed to go outside work uh, to work and have to stay at home after delivery. So women lack chances of socialization, job opportunities. So what should we do to advocate with their husbands and uh, uh, religious workers for that? Religious, region workers, regional workers, I'm not very sure what that is. I mean, whether I got it correctly. But Pam, do you, would you like to respond to that? Thanks everyone for your excellent contributions. I mean, the Next summary slide is actually just a few suggestions for how to address possible risks that have emerged from your HNO. But the suggestions that you've ha I highlighted in the two interactive discussions were excellent. And we are looking forward to actually seeing them in the 2023 HNO and HRPs. So we're really very excited about all of this. So, yes. I have uh, one uh, any thing would like to add it. Uh, you know that the policy maker are uh, playing uh, any, uh, any a good role in this by putting like uh, who have been any finished uh, before 18 years old. Thank you. Valerie, you were speaking about policy makers and their value. Is this in relation to um, child marriage? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, this is where the collaboration with development actors who are perhaps doing a very strong legislative advocacy with um, their government counterparts around passing a bill or a legislation that will prohibit um, child marriages, early enforced marriages. So this uh, aligns as well with that uh, humanitarian development nexus programming and engaging and leveraging the resources of development actors. So we do have time for additional questions. This is just a, a slide to capture some of the highlights in terms of you have this particular risk, risk uh, that you have identified in your HNO and these are the possible GBV risk mitigation measures. But the items, suggestions that you have articulated so far, uh, pale in this table pale, pale in comparison with the excellent uh, recommendations that you have outlined so far. So I think what's crucial here is if it's also feasible for you to incorporate some indicators to be able to track your GBV risk mitigation measures. Because as we know, if it's included in your uh, indicators, then it would be funded, it will be monitored, and you can uh, see how it is working uh, as the implementation of the response planning goes along. And we do have our Q&A. This would be facilitated by Sona or Brooke? Um, uh, go ahead, Brooke. 
I was just gonna say, go ahead, Sona. I don't see any. Um, <laughs> I don't see any specific uh, questions in the Q and A section. But if anyone does have anything um, at the moment, please do do raise your hand or put it in there. Um, yeah, and I think there was a question from Kedir, but that was responded to in the chat itself, right? I believe so, and there will be another Q and A. Um, after this section um, as well. So if more come up, no issues, we have time. And there's a question or observation from Zandra in the Q&A box. Zandra, would you like to expound or explain or share about this observation in terms of the joint needs assessment, uh, severe food insecurity higher for males than females? Yes. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you. And uh, yes, um, I would like to share with you that the latest uh, joint needs assessment in Colombia in, in migrant people, we found um, that the uh, food security, as, as I mentioned, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, interesting for us because uh, severe Food, food, secure, food insecurity is, is higher in, in, in male in male than uh, females, but in general, in the, in the total, yes, it, it, it affected more uh, the, the, the women, you know? Um, but uh, we are uh, finding that the, probably due to the criteria prioritization, prioritization in the um, in some uh, shelters, in some uh, centers that they uh, we provide some uh, uh, assistance, food assistance in for migrant people. And the other, and the in the other hand, we found that in in, in a specific uh, things such as access to intervention, nutritional interventions, despite the 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 percentage of uh, uh, undernutrition. Is higher in boys. The uh, the um, girls, you know, uh, have the uh, more the, the yes more access to mm -hmm. the um, interventions such as uh, management of acute nutrition, deworming, uh, and other uh, that that we provide. So it's important to be aware, you know, in the criteria how how we provide. A, or the based on the a gender equality in, in these kind of situations. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for sharing that. That's why it's very crucial that uh, when we do the data analysis, that it's really we try to capture and analyze data that is disaggregated by sex, age, and disability at the minimum, so that you can bring out this nuances in terms of whether food insecurity is higher for male, female, or male, female-headed households, and in terms of undernutrition, um, whether it's for adolescent girls, adolescent boys, for this age range of children, or in terms of household makeup, is it more prevalent for this uh, female-headed household or prevalent for adolescent children-headed households? So I think, thank you for pointing that out. So I don't think there are any more questions right now, not, the, I mean, unless they've got buried in the chat. So if so, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, ask them now. Um, but there will be another chance for a, for a round of Q&A after the next section, right, Pam? Yes. So, okay, so maybe you can uh, go ahead. I don't see any further questions. I don't see a hand raised. Please yes. go on, uh, Pamela, thank you. All right, so we would like to include this section in terms of the complementarity and linkages of gender-based violence risk mitigation with the other cross-cutting concerns or humanitarian reform agenda that cluster coordinators need to consider as well. Um, so we start with um, localization. So localization in, in, in its most basic, uh, essence is that it refers to the process of better engaging 
local and national. La participación de actores locales. Hello. Oh, eh, somebody dis eh, disconnected the interpretation. Please, the, the host needs to activate the interpretation. Sandra, this is where you were. Yes, I was just, I just did it. So it should be fine now. Carmelo and Marie. All right, we don't hear them now. Thank you, Sandra. So um, localization refers to our, the process of better engaging local national actors in all phases of the humanitarian action, including greater support for local action. So GBV risk mitigation puts uh, women's participation at the heart of our activities. So local women's rights, women-led organizations, uh, even organizations of persons with disabilities must be central players because they bring the voices of the women, the girls, and other marginalized groups into the response and help the cluster reach women and girls and discriminated groups in, um, and those who are very hard to reach. So it's there's that important linkage between the work of GBV risk mitigation and localization. Um, in terms of GBV risk, risk mitigation and linkages to accountability to affected population. So AAP is also central to the work of GBV risk mitigation and vice versa. So successful GBV risk mitigation can only be achieved if the affected population, especially women and girls and other groups at risk of gender-based violence, play a central role in all aspects of the emergency preparedness, readiness, and response. So what can we jointly do with AAP actors in the clusters and in the field that we're working is to be able to share um, timely, relevant, and actionable information with communities, uh, being able to support the meaningful participation and leadership of the affected people, the women's rights organizations, in the decision-making processes and the coordination mechanisms that we have, whether at national or subnational level, and making sure that the com community feedback mechanisms or systems are in, in place to enable affected people to comment on the performance of our humanitarian action, including having that um, capacity to be able to receive sensitive matters such as sexual exploitation and abuse. So all of these um, items and actions that pertain to accountability to affected populations support our GBV risk mitigation work. In relation to protection from sexual exploitation and abuse, um, this is also one aspect that can be incorporated in your standard GBV risk mitigation practice, making sure that in addition to the orientation on how to safely receive disclosures of gender-based violence that all nutrition staff and frontline workers have received an orientation or training on pro protection from sexual exploitation and abuse and making sure that they have signed code of conduct, not just at the staff level, but also ensuring that the members themselves of our nutrition cluster um, have a signed code of conduct or policy within their organization. These are just some of the key messages that we want to highlight. So all humanitarian sectors and actors are responsible for promoting the safety of women and girls and other marginalized groups and ensuring that we mitigate the risk for gender-based violence in our own humanitarian coordination and programming. And it's very crucial that we are able to match the risk that we have articulated in the HNO with the risk mitigation measures in our response plan and maximizing the capacity and the participation and engagement of our local actors, including women-led organizations and OPDs. And technical support is available from our side. So I will hand over to, to Brooke to expound more on that. Great, thanks, Pamela. 
Um, so just to give you a quick overview um, before we jump into our final Q and A, um, and there's any remaining questions that, that are there. Uh, just a brief overview of what the technical support team from the Global Nutrition Cluster Technical Alliance can provide. Um, next slide, please. So how we provide support, um, we can either do help desk support, which is kind of quick, quick support um, through for um, nutrition and emergency programming, advocacy, cluster coordination, et cetera, including gender and GBV support. Um, we can provide in-depth support, uh, something more like uh, six to eight weeks uh, that can either be in-country or remote, where technical advisors provide um, technical support either in-country or, or remotely. Um, and we have a consultant roster as well. So recommendations of technically vetted consultants, um, you select the best consultant and you bring them on board. Uh, next slide, please. You can find this, oh, apologies, additional technical support is also through UNICEF, through PAM, and the regional specialists that you might have. So please uh, make sure to take down PAM's email if you require any additional support as well. Uh, next slide, please. So for the Global, Tech, Global Nutrition Cluster Technical Alliance, our technical support on gender and GBV can be um, supporting, uh, providing existing resources, guidance, and tools on gender and GBV risk reduction, if you have any questions on where to find any of that, as well as capacity strengthening on gender transformative approaches, GBV risk reduction, um, integration of gender and GBV into nutrition programming, um, gender analysis studies, et cetera, review development of gender GBV policy strategies or action plans. Next slide, please. So where to find that request from the Global Nutrition Cluster Technical Alliance? Um, through the, this website uh, that's on the page here, the ta.nutritioncluster.net. If you go to that website and you see the orange request support button up on the upper right hand side, this request form will pop up and no question is too small. So we have a team of, of uh, advisors that are available for any nutrition um, request or question, um, as well as um, gender and GBV within nutrition as well. Um, so no request is too small, so please don't hesitate to use it. Next slide, please. Um, so the process is you submit the request. We will have a call, an initial scoping call um, with you to determine the needs together. Uh, we I find the best um, HR for you and identify the best funding. Uh, we prepare the support together and then it takes place with quality assurance and evaluation and follow up. Next, uh, next slide, please. So any final questions or reflections? Um, uh, Pam had put her email in the chat box there. So please, if you need anything, um, you can go through the through the Nutrition Cluster Technical Alliance website or contact Pam there um, through her email in the chat. Um, please do stay on after these final questions and uh, answers and reflections. Um, when you close out the Zoom, there will be a there will be a um, um, a feedback form, and we uh, really value your feedback um, to make our webinars. Uh, better for you uh, so that we can ensure that we're giving the most relevant information um, that is that is needed um, for all of you as um, as we provide that support. So any final, I'm going to hand it over to Sona, any final questions, comments, um, reflections that we might have. Um, it's been a really interactive um, session so far, which is much appreciated. So over to you, Sona. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, I see mainly thank yous in the chat, but if anyone has any uh, suggestion to share, any kind of experience to share, uh, any questions that 
have remained unanswered. Kadir, I, I noticed you had put in a couple of questions. Uh, I hope they've been answered, but if they haven't, please feel free to raise your hand right now or unmute yourself and speak. So to Bistrat just put in the Q&A, how to consider GBV in a context of um, internally displaced people. Oh yes, I just saw that, yes. Okay. So, uh, Pam, would you like Ms. to answer Rad, that yeah. one? Yeah. Yep. Ms. Rad, do you want to expound more on that? Okay, thank you. Uh, just to highlight, uh, like, uh, we have to consider this issue in a place where uh, people nowadays, particularly in Ethiopia, in some areas, there are camps like uh, where uh, internal displaced peoples are residing on it. So how do we really consider while doing the planning or something like uh, to consider into, into how to respond to this issue in particular with such kind of context? Is, is there any particular guideline or consideration when the situations like uh, in a camp or in, in particular areas? Thank you, and over to you. Thanks, Ms. Rad. I think the basic tool that we use in terms of identifying and surfacing risk in relation to gender-based violence would be our triple AQ framework. So in terms of, let's say, uh, accessibility, distance, where do you locate your um, nutrition centers or your OTPs or stabilization centers? Um, if there's limited mobility, uh, would it be feasible for the nutrition cluster and its members to create and establish mobile teams to be able to do that? Um, how can we make the center more accessible to the displaced community? And then in the previous discussions around the brainstorming with regards to uh, addressing community social gender related norms. I think those are excellent um, recommendations that can be customized further for your particular context. And the great thing about that is that you have colleagues uh, from Sudan, for instance, that, that have been implementing those kind of interventions. So they have like firsthand knowledge of how to design and deliver those interventions, whether it's relating to social behavior change or engaging community elders or even policymakers. Thanks, Pam. Uh, we have Zuhail who has raised her hand and then Norbert. So Zuhail, do you want to go first? Uh, Zuhal, sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this uh, nice and useful uh, webinar. It was really the uh, helpful for us, especially our uh, gender uh, officers in uh, Mexico, which will be uh, implemented in our uh, strategy of uh, implementing. So I, I guess um, the, the support that we can offer for the uh, uh, GBV regard to the health, if we could uh, make like um, in the forums monthly or uh, quarterly, for uh, all the uh, gender uh, sectors to develop or make the strategy so it would be helpful for us to implement it. Thank you. Thanks, Zuhal, for that very specific ask. And I think it's also, I think if you can relate to us even bilaterally, how you're able to work or collaborate with child protection sector and the gender-based subcluster in your specific context, because the information that they can provide in terms of available services would certainly help you uh, to be able to make that safe, confidential uh, provision of up-to-date information about life savings, child protection, and gender-based violence services whether you're doing it in a stabilization center or in an OTP or perhaps in nutrition awareness raising sessions. So please do let us know how you're collaborating with your child protection 
or gender-based violence sectors or clusters in the field. And if you have emerging good practices in terms of that collaboration, um, we would love to document that and also be able to perhaps see how it can be replicated in other contexts. Um, for instance, in Somalia, they have started an integrated collaborative framework between child protection, AOR, and also with nutrition cluster. So they're coming together and seeing how nutrition actors and members can be capacitated around psychological first aid, receiving disclosures of child abuse, as well as gender-based violence cases, and how they can link them up to life-saving services. So it's a, a field level initiative that I think when we do that exchange, cross-fertilization of um, good practices would be very much helpful for other contexts as well. Okay, that's uh, good. I think I like uh, Somalia, the Somalia's uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Really useful for uh, to reduce up the any, uh, ex, uh, especially the sexual exploitation that may occur for the women in the rural areas in uh, SKS or South Kordofan state because we are working in the rural area. And uh, women, especially, they are uh, facing so many uh, sexual abuse related to affect their health. And uh, if we can make the like uh, join. Um, uh, initiative for like network between the uh, nutrition uh, and other uh, protection uh, clusters, it would be useful to interact at least to know what is the uh, what is the gaps, what the needs, the priorities, and also we can make the intervention. Thank you so much, Sohal, for that. And I'm wondering because this has been articulated by gender-based violence coordinators when. Um, UNICEF colleagues presented in the gender-based violence area of responsibilities monthly meeting about several months ago, and they were sharing about um, gender-based violence related concerns vis-a-vis -vis nutrition outcomes. And the gender-based violence coordinators from the field uh, expressed in that meeting that they would want to have this platform where they can exchange um, expertise and also uh, mm -hmm. problem solve collectively some of these concerns from the field. So I think that is also something that we can in a way arrange or broker between child protection, GBV actors in the field and also with nutrition actors. So if that is something that can be helpful, we can do it uh, for X number of countries in similar contexts, or we can do it at regional level Please just let us know how we can best uh, facilitate that. Okay, I think it is uh, better and it would be useful if we can make uh, um, in the in the uh, countries that they they have the same uh, context, the same practices in the regional level. It would be useful. All right, thank you for that feedback, Suhal. Thank you, Suhal. Uh, so we also have a hand raised from Norbert. Albert, would you like to go ahead? I see you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Yeah. Sorry for me. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour, chers collègues. Je bon, je vais m'exprimer en français. C'est bon. Je peux y aller. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Merci. Alors, moi, je voulais partager une expérience que nous, nous avons réalisée au niveau de, euh, de, du Burkina Faso, plus précisément dans la province du, du centre-nord, dans le, la région de Kaya. En fait, on a mis en œuvre un projet de l'alimentation, du nourriture et du jeune enfant dans le contexte d'urgence. Mais c'est un projet où on a intégré la dimension euh, cohésion sociale et cohabitation pacifique. Parce que on a identifié un problème dans ce milieu, c'était un problème de cohabitation entre les déplacés internes et la population autochtone. Alors, notre projet de prévention de lutte contre la malnutrition, on s'est permis de d'organiser de concerts et de faire de pièces de théâtre, de pièces de théâtre qui relevaient l'implication de l'homme dans la réussite de l'alimentation 
du nourrisson et du jeune enfant. Um, one, aussi... one second, Norbert. Um, there's, an echo, there's an echo, it seems. And the interpreter is, is unable to, to hear you clearly. Are you able to perhaps um, move the microphone closer? Est-ce qu'on peut interpréter pour moi, s'il vous plaît? Je suis seul. Attendez, je vais mettre à l'ordre. Merci. Alors. Allô, je pense que comme ça, ça va aller mieux. Ok, super, merci. Alors, euh, ok, alors. Great, thank you. Ok. Je peux y aller? Ok. Merci beaucoup. Alors, moi, je voulais partager une expérience euh, d'un projet, projet de lutte contre la malnutrition, un projet préventif de l'alimentation du nourrisson et du jeune enfant dans le contexte d'urgence qu'on a réalisé. Nous sommes en train de mettre en œuvre au niveau du Burkina Faso, dans la, dans la province de Kaya, qui se trouve dans la région du centre nord. Alors, euh, ces projets, on y a intégré une dimension euh, cohésion sociale et cohabitation pacifique parce que on a identifié un certain nombre de problèmes et que dans ces au niveau de la région de du centre nord et précisément dans la province de Kaya il y a de déplacés internes et il y a de sites de déplacés il y a un problème de cohabitation alors on s'est dit ceci euh, on va organiser de on va faire des sensibilisations de masse on va organiser de concerts et de théâtre mais dans ce que nous allons faire nous allons ressortir l'implication de l'homme dans la réussite de l'alimentation du nourrisson et du jeune enfant, mais aussi l'implication le, le, de la, la bonne cohésion sociale et la cohabitation pacifique dans la réussite de l'alimentation du nourrisson du jeune enfant dans le contexte d'urgence, mais aussi on va en profiter pour véhiculer des messages de violence basés sur les gens. Comment est-ce qu'elle peut avoir un impact négatif dans la nutrition du nourrisson et du jeune enfant, mais aussi dans la nutrition de la femme enceinte et de la femme allaitante Nous, on s'est dit que la manière dont on attaque le problème, c'est beaucoup plus curatif. On s'est permis d'attaquer les problèmes de manière préventive. On a, on, on a, nous sommes entrés en contact avec l'OIM ainsi qu'avec le HCR. Nous avons écrit de messages de messages qui passent à la radio, à la télévision, de messages de sensibilisation. Allô De messages de sensibilisation disant que le, la réussite de l'alimentation du nourrisson et du jeune enfant passe aussi par la réussite, passe par l'implication de l'homme, mais aussi dans la, dans la bonne cohabitation, la bonne, dans la cohésion sociale et de la cohabitation pacifique, mais aussi dans la lutte contre le discrimination, encore le violence basée sur le genre. Parce que on a tout simplement identifié que ce sont les déplacés internes qui sont beaucoup plus violentés, euh, qui sont beaucoup plus victimes de violences basées sur les gens. Et, mais aussi, euh, euh, on a aussi expérimenté quelque chose au Mali et que euh, lorsqu'on utilise la stratégie de sortie de clinique mobile, euh, ça veut dire que on a on est beaucoup plus exposé à la personne, on peut beaucoup plus l'écouter. Pendant qu'il nous parle de, de, de ce problème de malnutrition, de lui et de son enfant, il peut aussi nous parler d'un problème, d'un problème exemple qu'il a été victime d'un violence basée sur les gens. Donc, on peut aussi le produquer quelques conseils ou on peut le demander, on peut le, on peut l'aider à aller dans un centre de prise en charge ou encore d'un référencement. Ça, c'est quelque chose que je voulais aussi mettre en accent avec eux. La stratégie de nutrition basée sur le sorti de clinique mobile nous amène beaucoup plus à détecter d'autres problèmes que la stratégie de prise en charge de manière classique que nous avons l'habitude de faire dans un centre. Dans un centre, les personnes ont du mal à tout dire. Mais par contre, euh, par contre, quand vous allez les voir dans l'air milieu, ils arrivent à dire tout, ils arrivent à dire tout ce qui les ressent. Et par là, je demanderais peut-être que, que nous puissions avoir une certaine gamme de 
de formation holistique que les prestateurs de soins nutritionnels soient aussi formés dans la dans le premier euh, prise en charge de personnes euh, violentées ou bien des personnes euh, victimes de violences basées sur le genre. Voilà un peu mes me deux contributions. Merci. Great. Thank you very much, Norbert. That was that was really uh, insightful and very good. Um, so really highlighting the need for a holistic approach uh, within a safe space to allow for, for us to, to address all of the needs that, that we're, we're coming across. And those were some really great examples. Thank you very much for, for sharing your experience um, and insight. Um, Sona, uh, back over to you. Yeah, we, we still have uh, Zuhal's hand raised. Is that from an earlier, um, is that an earlier hand or uh, do, would you like to say something else? Zuhal? Okay, if, uh, if not, then I think uh, we've had a lot of, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for such an amazing interactive session. And it's well noted, um, many of you asked for more, more like this. So that is well noted um, across the board and um, really good feedback. And if you um, can please, complete the short survey at the end of this, it'll pop up when you leave the, the um, when you leave the Zoom session, it will, the survey will pop up. That is where we can use all of that feedback to provide more uh, support like this, to provide more webinars um, like this, et cetera. Um, we are here for you, here to support all that you are doing um, within your context and your expertise uh, within the feedback that you've given in this webinar um, has, been, has been brilliant. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much to all of our interpreters for all of your, for all of your um, uh, support over the last hour and a half as well. And thank you, Pam, um, for, for Pamela, for the, for the brilliant um, presentations. So we look forward to hearing from all of you again. So good evening, good afternoon, and we will speak soon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. We will uh, fill the form of evaluations in uh, to get the feedback from us. Thank you. Uh, so Zuhal, Zuhal, you've asked if we've sent it on email. No, as soon as you close this, as soon as you leave the Zoom, you will get the interpretation, uh, The uh, evaluation form. Yeah, Thank it will you. automatically pop up. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.